There have been many mentions up to this point of the wonderful Perry Hewitt, who is about to come up and tell us. You can find her not just in the flesh here speaking to you, but also in every possible form of social media in her own and on behalf of Harvard. And I think she's going to tell you about some of the resources available within the university to do much of this and hopefully lead us also into some demos after this. And Perry, thank you. Good. Well, thank you very much for having me here. It's a privilege to be here, especially since, I don't know, John, if you know this, I went to the first ever Berkman Internet and Society Conference. Um, I was working for Harcourt, now Elsevier, I'm ashamed to say, um, and they wanted to send me to Gartner to learn about the Internet. And I said, I don't know, somehow this enterprise IT approach seems like it might not be the right way. So I'm going to talk a little bit about social at Harvard, you know, how we think about balancing influence and control, how we're doing it, and how we can be helpful to you, the faculty. So in February of this year, a piece ran in the New Yorker, I think it was Adam Gopnik, that talked about the impact of the information deluge that is the internet today. And what are the ramifications to that gentleman's question early on our collective intelligence? What does it mean for all of us? And this article divided the world into three categories, which I loved. It was the never betters, like Clay Shirky. It's utopia. Life has never been better. We've never had more access to information. It's fabulous. All social divisions have now broken down. The better nevers. The sky is falling. We can no longer think in more than 140 characters at a time. It's a disaster. What are we going to do? And the ever wasers, which is, sure, the tools are changing and the effects are wide range but isn't that the very essence of modernity, that we expect these tools to change and how we communicate to change? So I think the same division could be made about this brave new world of social media we live in today, the world in which we're intimately and constantly, to Dr. Boyd's point, connected to those of us, you know, our friends and our family. We carry our social graph with us wherever we go, um, you know, from our most intimate people we know the closest to the, way, the acquaintances we might meet at a conference who somehow show up on my Facebook page and I have no memory whatsoever of who they are. So for this social web transformation, I'm going to go with the camp of the ever-wasers and talk about why, how the tools have changed the game significantly. Uh, people remain people with the same positive and negative attributes they had going into this brave new world. And as you pointed out as well, you know, teenagers are now using code on Facebook to deceive their parents. How different and how the same the world really is. <laughs> So Harvard's a social place, right? This is a party in 1935. I found this in the archives, a party I really wish I'd gone to. The costumes look fabulous. And this, um, Professor Lewis remarked that he was here for the beginning of Microsoft and the, here of the beginning of Facebook. He was not here for the beginning of Twitter, which I believe this is the first instance of Twitter, which is actually a, in 1910, a bunch of Harvard students had a typewriter sitting with a, with a roll of paper that just rolled out and had what is essentially status messages, right? That's exactly what this is. If you read the middle one, it says, where the deuce are you? I thought that you were, we were going skating with me this afternoon. I'm furious. So that's pretty much like any tweet I've ever read. So the more things, plus ça change, people. Um, this is what Harvard looks like today. It's what a lot of campuses look like. It's how, you know, whether, as Sherry Turkle would say, are these students alone together? Are they socializing? There's a lot to be defined about what they're doing, but this is what they were doing the first sunny day in the yard in March 2010. Um, and really, it's changed the way, you know, the fabric of even how alumni <laughs> relate. So if you think of the most physical and traditional institutions that make up Harvard, even those start to look different with these new mobile, social, digital behaviors that are pervading all age groups. Um, and what does it mean to be at commencement anyway, right? In an age in which you can share information, in which, you know, Mr. IT and I collaborate on a live stream, and, you know, there's all this information going out there, you know, about commencement. You know, what does it mean to be physically present, and how much are you experiencing it versus capturing it to share with that social graph you now take with you everywhere? So I think the big challenge now is, as we think about this, is how are we balancing influence and control in this brave new world? So as a communication shop, so social technologies have emerged, giving every Harvard community member a potential megaphone. This is a David Malin's CS50, where he just basically pulls in and aggregates all the tweets. I was here about two days before my Twitter account was pulled in here. And you can see there's a real balance of control and influence in terms of thinking that, you know, I didn't ask for them to be pulled in. All of a sudden, I'm part of this bigger Harvard thing, is what I'm saying now, more Harvard than not. But what does it mean that this democratized access to media has changed the game? So as a university communication shop, right, we're not academics, we're the people who talk about the university. You know, 
We didn't really need to think about a different balance of influence and control. There's no letting. First of all, there's no letting faculty do anything. I'm married to one. I know how it goes. But there's no letting, you know, a thousand flowers bloom. This is, this is the world we live in, and it presents a lot of opportunity as well as a lot of adjustment. We can put some rules in place about, you know, use of name and provide some sensible best practices, which my office does. But our strategy should really recognize that every member of our community now has access to global communications channels that were unthinkable even five or ten years ago. And we should acknowledge that while there are risks, you know, inherent to this approach, there are also huge opportunities to what this enables us to do. You may not know, but Harvard's a slightly decentralized place. <laughs> and there's an opportunity through these social channels to tear down some of those walls. I'm not going to say, hey, business school, why don't we build one website with the divinity school? And then anyone can get everything in one place. That's not going to fly real well. But there are ways through social media where you can pull content thematically to deliver a more holistic experience of Harvard. So similarly to being unable to you know, control the voices around Harvard, you know, students are going to think of innovative ways to use and manage you know, their social web presences. I love this as I saw you, Harvard. It's essentially Craigslist misconnections. It's one of the most traffic sites at Harvard. Um, and they'll use it for pre-professional reasons too, right? HBS's startup drive was in the New York Times yesterday. It's frequently you know, mentioned in the media. It's a way that people interested in innovation around the university, not only this is HBS startup drive, but they've been very welcoming to undergraduates and people around the university interested in new programs and ideas. So you know, for a communication shop and in a university, influence versus control has been a balance. But this democratized access to media makes us really seriously rebalance in favor of influence. So what does this mean? It still means like we think and we care a lot about what we put on harvard.edu every day, but we also care a lot about what gets over a million impressions a day on Facebook. We're no Dr. Pepper. We have about 375,000 fans on Facebook, but it does mean when articles are picked up through our, what we post ourselves and what others post that we can point to about a million places that our content appears every single day. So our ability, to Professor Lewis's point earlier, to write, edit, publish, and deliver the canonical story of Harvard, you know, a hardbound edition, is decreasing. To deliver that one picture book, that one story, that one volume that says, Here, here's what Harvard is today. Here's the definitive, official, communications-blessed version. Um, so we worry a lot more about creating shareable content, getting shareable content from all of you, aggregating content from around the university, and sending it out, syndicating it out both through platforms we own and through platforms where we have outposts. So a platform we own would be the new harvard.edu launching this summer. A platform that's an outpost might be our Facebook play presence or our YouTube presence. So what's really changed is it's not a world in which we can sit and wait for people to come to our homepage. To your point earlier of, you know, what does it mean, you know, how much rear view, mirror view does Harvard have into what uni other universities are doing, other knowledge sharing institutions are doing, how much distance do we have between us and the next guy? Today, we can no longer say Harvard will build a homepage and people will come to it. People will form impressions based on what they glean directly, you know, from the great teaching and research coming out of Harvard, you know, all its websites, all its Facebook pages, all its YouTube channels. We can report on some small fraction of it with the Harvard Gazette, which is great, but the bulk of the information will come to you. So we've got to swim with that current and build systems to support that reality of all the content coming out from all over the university. So some more granular slides about how we're doing it. So we recognize that people want to share, so we help them. A couple years ago, we relaunched the Gazette. The traffic's up about 350%. So a lot of people come to it, use it, share the content. Um, that's one of my favorite stories that was big this year, Thinking Like an Octopus, that was picked up on a lot of social web channels about uh, how octopuses think. And one of the things we did, there are some negatives, you know, as was pointed out earlier, of bringing your social graph wherever you go. Sometimes there are real positives to bringing your social graph wherever you go. So when we put Facebook recent activity on the Gazette pages, usage and travel around the Gazette per unique visitor you know, really spiked because people would come and say, oh, I read this article, but John read this other article. Maybe that article will be of interest to me. And we also you know, help people share in devices that are most intimate to them, right? These mobile devices that are now never more than 12 inches from our hands. And so we built an app that delivers news via that device, and we enable people to share. And recently, we enabled a custom URL. So again, we can't be all one Harvard in all our web presences or all our you know, faculty, nor should we. But we can be all one Harvard through our domain, our URL, our Harvard me. So we participate because social pours a vacuum. This is one of my favorite stories. When I first came, we had this fabulous admissions video. And I said, hey, can I put it on YouTube? And there was, there was sort of a shocked reaction. You know, one does not put admissions videos on YouTube. I said, OK. One didn't know. Um, 
Uh, and about a year later, Yale put out this hilarious, campy eight-minute admissions video that took YouTube by storm. There's something like 850,000 views, 895,000 views. And I got calls from everyone in the university. Well, how come there's no Harvard admissions video? Because people were searching Harvard admissions video, and they got some hilarious parody like, you know, Harvard Tractor Trailer School or an Art Harvard Time parody. So what were you thinking? I said, I know. One's very sorry. I'll get it up there immediately. <laughs> um, but it's just super interesting that this idea of you know, I think you said earlier, writing yourself into being on the social web. And while there were all these representations of Harvard as a 375-year-old institution with all this stuff going on, of course, you know, there was all this representation of Harvard, but Harvard wasn't representing itself. And nature abhors a vacuum, and social abhors a vacuum. So another way we've tried to sort of enliven or bring social into the experience is by, with live streams. So President Faust has been incredibly forward thinking on this because people can post whatever they post and people always say, do you moderate beforehand? We say, no. You know, we just let people post what they post. If it's hate speech, we take it down, but that's pretty much it. This economic panel stinks, can stay. That's fine. That's one person's opinion. But we've really been able to open up using a variety of tools, you know, the, the live stream experience of Harvard and people have been very supportive of that. And then, you know, I was just astonished on any number of levels to see President Obama on the stool at Facebook. It was really interesting to see how many governmental sort of state offices are you know, emulating that trend or taking it to an even greater degree. That banner looks very much like 1999 Web. Isn't that like the president in Comic Sans? I couldn't quite get over it. Um, another thing we do, which we hope benefits schools and faculty, is the idea of providing platforms and tools. So to the point of when do, you, when do you have core principles and you know exactly what you're going to do when you run a pilot and you, you move forward very planfully, and when do you steam forward and experiment? This has been a little bit more on the steam forward and experiment side because I think we knew that social abhorred a vacuum and we had this great content and we, there were really pressing reasons to get it out there. Professor Sandell's justice content was one of the reasons, but there was a lot of other stuff that was just, it was on the internet but it was sort of lying fallow in websites that were poorly trafficked or embedded in players that no longer worked. So we sort of started, wanted to sort of use that opportunity to find content that was already existing, that professors had already created, that was already blessed for public, and yet it was just sort of marooned where it was. So we've had some good successes here. We've been able to, you know, with the iTunes particularly, you know, rising tide floats all boats. So, you know, little known feeds like the Memorial Church feed, for example, we pulled in. They did a, I think it's a podcast or a video cast that we've had for ages. And the fact that we had it available through the iTunes U channel at the regrettable passing of Reverend Gomes was a huge asset because people were already coming there and they thought, oh, I read about this man in the New York Times. I'd like to understand more about him and his church and his mission. And that content was there. So just aggregating that content, syndicating it out, really amplifies the content for everyone. Uh, so we also have done you know, some foray into location-based with Foursquare that hasn't been heavily promoted or heavily pushed. We care deeply about student privacy and student privacy issues. So all the content that we post to these channels are content that already exists on whole closed Harvard sites or on you know, Harvard domain sites. This is a way to, to spread and amplify the content, not the only means to get to this content. And you know, reaping the amplification benefits is really real. So on the left is JFK 50, which is a series of videos put together for the 50th anniversary of the inaugural. And on the right is Science and Cooking, that very, very popular gen ed class. These are not the classes themselves, they're the public lectures. But it was a way to say, you know, we really want you know, this content to live beyond you know, this immensely popular, you know, was sold out in Sanders right away. You know, how do we make this more accessible? And then the New York Times called, which I think is a currency faculty recognized, you know, YouTube, whatever, but you know, New York Times, New York Times calls most people even here will pick up the phone. And they called and said, we want to do a feature on your signs and cooking, but can you make sure all your videos are on YouTube so we can link to them? And I thought, you know, sort of a light bulb went off a little bit at CIS, who's definitely sees the value, but saying, hmm, you know, there, there is benefit even to traditional media. So the real focus today is how can we be helpful as a communication shop to what all of you are trying to do, which is the core of what universities do do, the teaching, learning, and research. So, you know, there, there's some new data coming out. This is from actually Pearson Learning Group um, about, you know, how faculty are beginning to use social media. A lot of it seems to be structured around consumption on YouTube and less around posting. <laughs> But increasingly, you know, faculty report using at least one social media device. And we know that faculty are using social media for you know, professional non-class purposes, particularly latter faculty. And you know, to my mind, there's a tremendous opportunity 
You know, there, there's a way to refine the rough cut without sending out the bad draft. Uh, different people feel very differently about that, but there's a tremendous opportunity there. There's a medium for testing the waters, cross-organizational collaboration. A way to discover, as I did with communications, found content. You know, comments from conferences, for example. These com think of all the smart comments you've ever heard at a conference that just vanish into the ether. Increasingly, social tools like Twitter like, you know, are going to be capturing and storing and saving and allowing people to categorize those comments to get sort of found content or found knowledge. And a greater ability for impact, I guess this was the theme of the day, beyond journal circulation. If you don't have access to JSTOR, how do those great ideas get out there? So what's our piece in all this? You, know, you guys are involved with the teaching, learning, and research, which is the core of what the university does. So our piece is a couple of things. It's to develop best practices for social participation for you and your schools and to manage the platforms, which are both third party, like YouTube and iTunes, and a new harvard.edu, where Harvard content is aggregated for greatest reach. Thank you. I want to thank everybody for uh, participating in this session. I'm absolutely, I think I'm overstimulated is probably a way of saying it. But outside, we've arranged to have some computers set up. So if people are interested in learning how to set up a Twitter account or how to set up a blog or other kinds of things, we have some people outside who will actually just introduce you to the ideas. So uh, with that, why don't I thank our panelists again for all their their effort and